A few weeks ago, Sarah Cox took me back to the Abbey Road Studios, and here is how we got on. Sarah, welcome to Abbey Road Studios. Now, everybody thinks I was born in India. Well, I was, but I was really born in Studio Two right here at Abbey Road. I mean, come on, you were 17 years old. The yes. year was 1958. Here we are, 64 years later. Can you believe it? I can't believe the building is still standing after all the people <laughs> that have been here. And you're still standing. I'm still standing. <laughs> yeah, well, come on in. Shall come we go on, in? OK, let's go okay. in. After I'll take you. you through. Abbey Road, Studio 3 we're in. We couldn't get Studio 2, which I believe has been the same story for decades. Throughout your entire career, there was always a battle for Studio 2, is that right? Everybody thinks the Beatles created Studio 2 and were the first ones in there, and they were not. Zadars and I were in there five years before them. So actually, ladies and gentlemen, I owned the studio, they merely rented it from me for a while <laughs> and very successfully, and of course they did make it famous. When I met Paul here at the studio once to celebrate, I think the 100th year or something like that of EMI, he said to me, you know, you and the band really upset us. And I said, why? They said, because every time we rang to call for the studio, you had it. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> we were both getting angry with each other for the same reason, and none of it was true. We weren't, neither of us were just favourites. I think record companies just like people who sell records. And I started selling records, and so did they. Think of the shadows, and you think of Cliff Richard. More now than number one British male singer, he's voted the world number one. As a 17-year-old, I mean, that's extraordinarily young to be coming into the world's first purpose-built recording studio. Were you overwhelmed? Were you excited, nervous? How was it? When we first started playing, it's, I was just out of school, mm. and these friends of mine were, were at school with me, and we joined a skiffle group, and then we decided that skiffle wasn't our music, we liked rock and roll, so we started a rock and roll band and played in local pubs and stuff. One guy came into the pub one night and said, I can make you a star, and once we picked ourselves off the floor laughing, he started work on it, and uh, we went to Norrie Paramore of EMI and did an audition, and that day, my uh, Ian Samuel had started, or yes, he'd started to write a song, it was incomplete, but Norrie said, sing it to me, and it was Move It, my first record. Come on, pretty baby, let's move it and groove it. Jack Good started a TV show called Oh Boy. And when they played him my record, he said, if you want your boy on my show, he ain't gonna sing Schoolboy Crush. It has to be Move It. And as a song, did it feel special? Did it feel like it was it was different? It was going to cause such a big splash? Yeah, no, no, not really, although we thought it sounded like rock and roll. The introduction was by a musician that was brought in to join us, and he played... <laughs> and it was that... <laughs> stuff that Ian Samuel used to play, and he played that on the record. But the minute he sang it to us with that, it sounded strangely American. At this point with Move It, were you still Harry Webb? When did Harry Webb get booted uh, out the back Harry door Webb got and Cliff Richard was born? Yeah, we yeah. dumped Harry Webb. <laughs> when I was at the coffee bar, the Two Eyes coffee bar, a guy came in, Harry Gratrix his name was, he came in and said, well, I'd like to book you for my ballroom in Ripley and Derbyshire. And we said, we'd come. And then he said, OK, what's the name? I said, the Drifters. He said, no, what's your name? I said, Harry Webb. He said, OK, Harry Webb and the Drifters. I said, oh, no, 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 no. It's I'm the lead singer of the Drifters. He said, well, if you don't want the job, forget it. We went down to the pub they called the Swiss, and we sat there and created. The last few names I remember were Russ Clifford. And I said, that doesn't sound right to me. They said, what about Cliff Russard? And I thought, Cliff? Rock face, rock and roll, Cliff's OK. Cliff's kind of cool. And somebody suggested Richards. Yeah. And Ian Samuel, who wrote Movit, said, take S off it. That means you now have two Christian names and it's a tribute to Little Richard. I thought, that's it. And Cliff <laughs> Richard was born. So, Sir Cliff, tell us about your new album, Christmas with Cliff. What can we expect? Well, I mean, 
I'd like to think that when people play the album, it's not quite what they expected, but maybe better than they expected. And that's what every artist, I think, should aim at and probably does aim at. What I did was I worked with two different producers. One was a real rock and roll fan. One of them was much more classical in his ways. So I have these two different types of music that are on there. So I'm very happy. They've given me everything that I needed to have dynamics. So one minute I could be singing, a child is born, doo -doo 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 -doo. and the next thing I'm going, rocking around the Christmas tree. So, <laughs> and I've got it, it's worked. They've given me an album that is dynamic. It, it goes up and down and up and down. Now, you've recorded over a 1,000 songs over the course of your career. Mm. Um, which ones for you really stand out? Well, all the number ones stand out. Mm. You, there's no way of beating a number one other than by another number one. But in technical terms, I've, there, there are other songs that I quite like. There was a song I did last year that I'd never sung on stage, and when I was going through the old material, I found it. It was called Marmaduke. Marmaduke, Marmaduke. Have you seen your brother Luke? It's an anti-war song, really. Marmaduke, dear Marmaduke, ha have you seen your brother Luke? They took him off to fight a war. Together we will laugh no more. Oh. I would rather sing that than Living Doll. Yeah. But I'm never going to stop singing Living Doll. Got myself a crying dog and sleeping, walking, Living Doll. The fans remember things in their life. We become part of their memories. Yeah. So they deserve to get it. I think next year is going to be my 65th year in in the business. And so along with me, my fans who have stayed with me solidly through the years have got the same memories of the same songs. She's just a devil woman with evil woman. Yeah, they might have preferred Living Doll to Devil Woman, and Devil Woman people might have preferred that to Living Doll, but in, in a way it doesn't really matter because between them they have given me a life and a career. You mentioned that these songs have given you this fantastic career and your career has spanned not only music but movies, theatre productions, your own TV shows. Um, so with the film Summer Holiday and The Young Ones, had you thought about acting before? I was introduced to acting at school by um, my school teacher, Jay Norris, because she's the one that said you got to join the the, the drama society. Mm. And so I joined it and sure enough, I, she put me in two or three plays and I got to act a bit on stage. And was it Ratty in Wind of the Willows that was yes, your Ratty debut Luna, performance? Yes, that's right. You played Heathcliff in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. Quite a contrast to your own on-stage persona and personality. Yes. So was it, was it quite nice to, uh, you know, connect with your inner brute with Heathcliff? It was fantastic. First of all, I thought this was a romantic role, but then when I read it over again, and I thought, no, oh, this is a... This is a nasty story. I mean, he was so obsessed with Kathy yeah. that nobody or nothing else mattered to, in the, to the extent that he was very brutal with other people. Were the Cliff Richard fans in the audience, did they try to stop themselves screaming and, and squealing? No, and how, I think, how was the atmosphere in the theatre? The fact was that I was 60 years old at that stage, and I'd already been on in front of the audience for a long time, and I'd yeah. done different things, and I'd even done a couple of stage plays. So they were quite happy to watch it, yeah. and they fortunately liked it. Um, you've hosted a lot of your own TV shows. Tell us a bit about your first BBC series, It's Cliff Richard. Oh, uh, I mean, that was fun to do, actually. We did three series of 13 shows in each series, and it was uh, quite a magical time. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hank Marvin. Stops. Olivia Newton John was a regular on the show. She became a regular for about eight weeks. And uh, 
And uh, the camera loved her, the cameramen loved her, I loved her, the audience loved her. And we've remained friends right until the last moment. Yeah. It somehow leaves you empty. And, it, and she's left a lot of people feeling very empty. So I thought, well, at least I can do my tribute and sing my final time with Olivia on, on the show. The Royal Albert Hall was where you performed in the 1968 Eurovision Song Contest, singing Congratulations. That's where I lost. Congratulations and celebrations. I lost that by one single point. It was, was it a fix? Because General Franco, rumour is that the ruler of Spain at the time wanted to... Yeah, and the, the whole improve. idea that maybe it was a fix was only because he was desperate to make Spain a, a tourist attraction yes. where people would go, and, of course, they did start going there. But that year, Congratulations became the fastest-selling single in the history of Spanish records. Yes. And I thought, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> You made history again, being the only pop star to appear at Wembley for five decades straight. But what about the event? Oh, the event was... Huge! It was one of the biggest things I took on because uh, I tried to produce a show that lasted five hours. It was just fantastic. I met a girl and she told me she loved me. I said, you love me, then love me, because you must like what I like. There was a lot of policemen around for security. And I, they were on their horses. I said, how my fans behaved? They said, the worst thing they did, they kept feeding our horses. <laughs> and I said, thank you, perfect. The fans behaved really well. It's nice to find that you've broken records, but you, you don't actually aim at that, do you? I think that the most important record for me is having sold out 32 shows at the Albert Hall. Young ones. That sounds like it was a lot of hard work, a lot of fun, hard work. But also, throughout your career, you've always been able to laugh at yourself. You recorded Living Doll with the Young Ones. Yes. Can I go now? Um, <laughs> you did a fantastic sketch with Morecambe and Wise, with really incredible comedy timing. <laughs> Is it out of your comfort zone to do that kind of thing? No, not really. We've had a few smiles just talking about various things because it just comes into mind. Like, when I'm in America, they don't really know me in America. And so the funniest things have happened to me there because they don't know who I am. And it's America one of the few places on the planet where you're not really recognised and you're quite happy to keep it that way, is that right? Yes, I am very happy to keep it that way now. I wasn't 10 or 15 years ago. That must feel bizarre. Because wherever you go everywhere else, there must be... It's a cliffish, cliffish. No, but it's fantastic for me, because I can go around not b bothering about being stopped anywhere, yeah. and it's quite nice. <laughs> so I like the fact that people that I meet don't know who I am. Mm. They've accepted me as a friend before they knew who I was. Let's talk a little bit about your faith. It's hugely important to you. Uh, talk to me a little bit about when you became a Christian and what yes, led I... you down that path. I was brought up with a family that was religious. They tried to encourage me to go to church, which I did, mm. and it wasn't until getting with the shadows and finally getting on tour after having had Move It that we would travel on these buses, coaches, all around the country and have hours on these coaches. And what we, we'd talk about sex, politics and religion. Mm. Not necessarily in that order, but regularly religion. And when it came up, I, I said, well, I, said, well I, I can't believe there's nothing there. There has to be something there. What God can do. And I chose Jesus because I thought, well, he's part of history. And the more I read about it, the more I read about him and what he did and how God wants love to be the predominant factor in somebody's life, it kind of sucked me in and I, I very easily took it. It's, it's definitely part of my life, always. And do you feel like it's ever been difficult to be a pop star and a Christian at the same time? I did originally. Yeah. In fact, I, 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 perhaps one of the biggest mistakes I made was that when I, I thought, OK, this is it. I've said, Jesus, you know, I trust you, I believe you, and I'm going to be the Christian I want to be. 
I then called the press together and said, OK, uh, I've got some commitments over the next two years that I've got to fulfil, and then I'm, I'm leaving. And then, of course, there was all this whole thing about Cliff Scott God and, mm -hmm. and everything like that happened. And in practical terms, you wanted to get your religious education O-level, is that right? I Teaching? did do the O-level. You did the O-level? Yeah, I went you... to a, one of my friends was a teacher. And you, did you nearly become a teacher? Or... I wanted to do something valuable and I couldn't think what I could do. Um, now I look back, I think, well, I, I maybe could have been a good teacher or I certainly could have worked for a charity. You've had the hugely successful career, but you've used that to help people in a, in a Christian way with your charitable foundation. You must have helped so many people. I put money into my charitable trust mm. and uh, it'll be in my will as well as my family and friends. So it's, it's something that you know you feel you can do. 1995, you were knighted by the Queen for services to charity, the first pop and rock singer to become a sir. Um, how did it feel and what did the Queen say to you in that well, moment? First of all, let me correct you. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the first. Oh. Bob Geldof was the first, but he was an honourable knighthood because he's Irish. Right. And so I can then say, Oh, yes, I was the first British artist to be a knight. But Bob did it for all his charity work that he was doing at the time. Mm. And for me, it was just a, a thing out of the blue. When I opened the letter, I couldn't believe it. I was just... It was so wonderful. When I went there, we had to meet this guy, and he said, I'll show you how to, what mm -hmm. to do. When you get to the stage, you'll be announced. And, and he said, don't say anything unless she says something first. So we're all, and it was nerve wracking. And do you feel, did she do the whole sword? Yeah. Do you I, feel I it? Joke, I said, I only must. It was so wonderful. When I went there, we had to meet this guy and he said, I'll show you how to, what mm -hmm. to do. When you get to the stage, you'll be announced. And, and he said, don't say anything unless she says something first. So we're all, and it was nerve wracking. And do you feel, did she do the whole sword? Yeah, do you I, feel I always it? joke. I said, I only was a bit worried because when she came, she came like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, she came and they dubbed the shoulders. Yeah. And then she, it's a sword is handed to somebody. And then she put the, the medallion around mm. my neck. And then I was permitted to stand up. And then she said, Oh, she said, this has been a long time coming. <laughs> And I went, I couldn't talk. <laughs> and I said to my sisters, the Queen's probably in her bedroom now saying, why don't we give it to someone who could talk English? <laughs> it was so emotional, I couldn't put words together. So, Sir Cliff, you and Christmas, you go together like turkey and stuffing or nut <laughs> roast and stuffing for yes. our veggies out there. <laughs> are, you a, are you a big fan of Christmas? Is it a big family occasion for you? Pa paint the picture. I mean, I love Christmas. I've always loved it. I mean, my fans know that I love it. My sister used to come with her children regularly to me at Christmas, but I now reside in Barbados. And what's a Bayesian Christmas like? Is it lovely? Are you on the beach if you're in Barbados? Yeah, you can, I'm not a beach person, really, but you, you could be on the beach. It's always hot at Christmas. The very first Christmas there, it took three showers and about four hours to put up a Christmas tree. <laughs> it was so hot, I couldn't believe it. And then I got used to it thinking, oh, yeah, we're always dreaming of a white Christmas, but it's just as good if you've got your good friends and family around you and you're having a nice meal together. It's, it's always going to be a good time. Now, I hate to ask you this question. I think your fans will be furious with me. No, they won't. Will you ever retire? Can you see a time where you won't be Sir Cliff Richard on stage or in a studio? I don't think retire is in my vocabulary, really. Mm. But I might stop. Mm -hmm. You know, buses stop all the time, but they don't stop rolling. Mm. So my idea is to, in a way, I kind of started. I don't work as m madly as I used to. Um, so I do shorter tours and the only thing I don't ever want to give up is recording. So that's the thing I love best of all. But retiring means you, if you come back, you have to make a comeback. Two years from now, I might want to appear at the Albert Hall mm. for a couple of days and I might ring up and say, can we get the Albert Hall and I'll do a couple of shows? So that I think would be the best way for me to, do, to treat it so that I would feel free. Um, what would you like your epitaph to be? I had a headline in a music paper called Melody Maker. I had gone to Belfast to do a gospel concert, and there were all sorts of problems going on at that time. But nevertheless, I did it, and the Melody Maker had come and seen it, and the headline was, 
rock and roll and God work brilliantly in the hands of someone who loves them both. So I thought, that's my gravestone. I'd, I'd be very happy to have that on it. That's fantastic. It's been brilliant to chat to you, Sir Cliff Richard. Oh, thank thank you. you so much, and may I wish you a very, very happy Christmas. Thank you, and you too. Thank